It's been a couple of months since the last episode of Strange, Creepy and Mysterious Things I found on the internet. God, that's a mouthful. Anyway, here we are for episode 5. Be sure to check out the other four if you haven't already. They're not really related, so you can watch them in any order. If you enjoy internet mysteries and generally disturbing content, feel free to subscribe and turn on notifications for more content like this. I also have a Patreon and a PayPal, so if you're interested in supporting the channel, feel free to check those out, links will be in the description. I'm excited to announce that Honeygain have decided to cooperate with this video and they're kindly offering a giveaway exclusively to my subscribers. Honeygain is an app that lets you earn money by using your internet connection to gather information from the web, which helps businesses out in many different ways, one being price comparison. Let's say you want to buy a plane ticket, the cost of which varies depending on location. Websites can connect to Honeygain's network, allowing you and others to find the best deal. All you need to do to earn a passive income is sign up, download and install the app and keep it running in the background. You can use my promo code INVESTIGATOR for $5 totally free. You can earn more by inviting your friends and family to join. Once they start earning, you'll earn a recurring bonus equal to 10% of their daily earnings. You might be thinking this sounds too good to be true, but it's safe to use, doesn't collect your data and doesn't ask for any permissions on your device. The money you earn isn't going to pay your rent, but it could cover the cost of your monthly Netflix or Spotify subscription, and the more devices you use, the more you'll earn. To be in with a chance of winning $50 worth of credits, all you need to do is keep the app running for at least three days in a row, and include your referral code in a comment below. Join millions of users who started earning easy money with Honeygain and get $5 by registering and using the code INVESTIGATOR. This video will cover topics that some may find disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. You can head over to my Patreon for an uncut version of this video, which features a whole extra entry that was too graphic to include in this cut. Humanleather.com is the website for a company that claims to sell wallets, briefcases, belts, and other items made from real human leather. If you visit the site now, you'll be met with just one page that features an About Us section. It reads, We are a specialised leather products company and we only work to a very specific order book. In fact, we only craft a very limited number of pieces per year, depending on our stock of raw material. We closed our order book a few years ago as our waiting list became too large for us to be able to service all our outstanding requests. We will soon, however, be opening our waiting list again to our exclusive clientele. Please keep your inboxes and your minds open. More information can be found by looking at archives of the site, and there's a history page where they explain that they are specialists in producing a very limited number of exquisite and exclusive products for an extremely discerning clientele. They highlight that human leather has been used in the past for binding anatomy books, using the skin of the cadaver to encase the knowledge that he had bequeathed, though it's not used so much today because of social and religious taboos. The company's goal is to reintroduce human leather because it's the softest, smoothest and finest leather that is obtainable. How exactly is it obtained, you might be wondering. Surprisingly ethically, it seems, or so we're led to believe. They state that they can't reveal the source of the raw product, but it's implied that someone would agree to donate their skin before they die. Then after death, the skin is harvested and the donor's next of kin is rewarded. They claim it isn't illegal, which as far as I'm aware, isn't true. The site used to be humanleather.co.uk before it was .com and both redirect to the same site now, so it must be based in the UK and laws over here prohibit the sale of human organs or tissue. One reason for that might be because it's not fair for someone to die because they can't afford to buy an organ that would save their lives. That would be irrelevant here though, because the human leather is not being sold for a medical purpose. But I assume the main reason is to prevent organ trafficking, which could still be a concern here. The site does specify donors as opposed to unwilling victims, but they also refuse to reveal the source of the raw product, so who knows. 
Anyway, I'm fairly certain that the sale of human leather is illegal in the UK and many other countries, unless there is some kind of loophole due to the skin not being used for medical purposes, but I doubt it, at least when it comes to skin taken directly from a human body. Just jumping in here while editing, I did a bit more research since I originally filmed this and I'm now thinking that selling human leather might not actually be illegal. According to the Human Tissue Authority, under Section 32 of the HT Act, it is an offence to engage in commercial dealings in controlled material. Controlled material means material which consists of, or includes, human cells, excluding gametes and embryos, which is, or is intended to be, removed from a human body for the purpose of transplantation. A person guilty of an offence under Section 32 is liable to imprisonment and or a fine. The HT Act is, however, silent on the sale of bodies, body parts or tissue for other purposes, and such sales are therefore outside the remit of HTA. The exception to paragraph 4 is the sale of items derived from or including human tissue that are visible to the public whilst on sale. The public display of human tissue is an activity which is subject to licensing by the HTA and strict legal requirements relating to consent. Anyone displaying human tissue in public without an HTA license for public display or without the appropriate consent may be liable to imprisonment and or a fine. That could explain why the human leather company doesn't show any photos of their products on the website. I assume the images they do have are just stock photos. But if I'm not mistaken, all that means that providing the skin is sourced consensually and the product is not visible to the public, the sale of human leather is legal. In 2016, design researcher Tina Gorjank displayed products from her Pure Human collection at Central St. Martins, an art school in London. The collection included two bags and a jacket made from human skin grown in a laboratory, and not just any human skin, but Alexander McQueen's, a fashion designer who died six years earlier. DNA was extracted from a sample of his hair, grown in a lab, then tanned and processed into the final product. Tina seems to have two main motives here. To highlight the lack of rights regarding our own genetic information, she didn't need McQueen's prior permission or his family's permission to take the hair sample and grow skin from it, and she even filed a patent for the human leather material. The second motive relates to ethics and sustainability. Similar to lab-grown meat, lab-grown leather would not only avoid killing animals, but would be more environmentally friendly too. The thought of having a handbag made out of human skin is really gross to me, but objectively, the human leather company makes a fair point that that's probably only because of the social taboo. I guess it's not really that different to other leather. I think I'll probably stick to PU or something, but each to their own, I guess. You might be wondering who would buy such products from the human leather company, other than Ed Gein, of course, though I think he enjoyed the DIY aspect of his creations. The company takes their customers' privacy pretty seriously, and they don't really reveal much information on them. They even avoid showing photos of their products because they're made to order, and showing them could risk the anonymity of their clients. Whoever their clients are, they're pretty well off, considering the cheapest item you can get is a wallet that costs at least $14,000. A belt costs upwards of $15,750, and shoes cost at least $27,000. They later began selling human leather power bracelets for 500 euros each, such as the San Vishu Manipura bracelet, which claims to provide physical power, mental clarity and fearlessness. In January 2011, they announced they were no longer taking orders for some time due to a high demand, and it seems that they never really started back up, at least not openly. There never appeared to be any options to buy the products on the site, and it's implied that if you wanted to place an order, you would contact them, then possibly be put on a waiting list, but it sounds like they're a bit selective of who they accept as a client. That would make total sense if the source of the human leather wasn't as ethical as they made out, and they also make it clear that you can donate or pay money anonymously. The human leather company is certainly eerie and very odd, but overall I'm fairly convinced it's not real. I say fairly because I don't think it's beyond the realm of possibility that such a company exists or existed. Stranger things have happened, but unless they manage to exploit a legal loophole, I'm pretty sure what they're doing is illegal, and having a website discussing it so openly on the clear net is a pretty good way to get arrested. It's probably someone's creative project or maybe a social experiment as there was a contact email on the site. 
If that's the case, they've kept it going for a long time. According to Whois, the domain was registered in 2008 and updated in 2020 to expire in 2025. The website has changed over time and is now more basic than ever, but it's still clearly the same human leather company. It's odd that they're still paying for the domain and updated it so recently, yet the site hasn't changed in some time. It's not like the site even has ads or any clear way of turning a profit. There is some information for donating, but I have no idea if it'd work. A surprising number of people I found discussing this online don't seem to doubt it for a second. There's a Daily Dot article where the writer says that they hope it's a hoax, but they don't actually disprove it. There's also a hilarious article on exposingsatanism.org that I have to read a quote from. Lots of human sacrifice and organ harvesting going on here, and I would bet in the near future you will hear more about this as the people and Luciferians are brought to justice. These extremely discerning clientele are sick and depraved. The very ones who worship Lucifer and are running the world. They are the swamp creatures disguised as angels of light. This guy clearly thinks it's 100% real and he is pissed. He genuinely believes that people are being murdered for this and I don't know where people come into it but he suggests that they sacrifice kids and take their skin to send to the company to make products out of. He also thinks the company and their clientele need to be investigated, arrested, convicted and quote, properly executed. Anyway, whether or not the human leather company exists or ever existed, it's still an interesting project and it's funny to think that human skin, albeit lab grown, could potentially have a place in sustainable fashion in the future. Hashima Island is an abandoned island around nine miles away from the center of Nagasaki. From 1887 to 1974, it was inhabited and used as a seabed coal mining facility. A variety of structures were built on the island, including apartment blocks, shops, a town hall, school, a hospital, cinema, and swimming pool. From the 1930s until the end of the Second World War, it's thought that conscripted Korean civilians and Chinese prisoners of war were forced to work on the island, though more recently some have disputed that and claimed the workers volunteered to do the jobs. It's estimated that around 1,300 labourers died due to harsh conditions and poor treatment resulting in accidents, exhaustion and malnutrition. When petroleum replaced coal in Japan in the 1960s, Coal mines began shutting down and eventually so did the mines on Hashima Island in 1974. Within a few months, all inhabitants were moved off the island and it has been more or less abandoned ever since. In 2009, a very small area of the island was reopened for tourism, but over 95% of the island was too dangerous to visit. Many buildings have totally collapsed over the years and others aren't far off, mainly due to typhoon damage. In 2013, a Google employee visited Hashima Island with a camera to capture 360 degree images of the area, allowing anyone to look around parts of the island that have rarely been seen for decades. I'm sure you can probably just find it on Google Maps, but hashimaisland.co.uk is a website dedicated to it and in addition to some pretty spooky sound effects, it also has a section with information about the main points of interest that you can read through while exploring the island. Kinda like having a guided tour. You can see the NICU flats where the miners lived and left behind many personal belongings. The stairway to hell, which leads to the Senpukuji temple. Block 65, which is more apartments. Close by is an area called Salt Rain Crossing, where people had to wait for waves caused by typhoons to clear so they could cross to the shops. You can also visit the primary school, the final building ever to be erected on the island, Glover House, another block of apartments near building 31 that was used for communal baths amongst other things, and the coal storage area, which is pretty self-explanatory. I'm pretty sure that when you flick through the pages of information on the different attractions, it's supposed to take you to that area. For some reason that wasn't working for me when I visited the site. I tried on two different days too, so I think it's probably an issue with the site. You can still wander around and read the information, and you can see each location on the map, but I'm useless at reading maps, so there's no point me even trying to find each location. I'll probably just keep checking back to see if it gets fixed. I find abandoned buildings in general quite creepy, so seeing a whole island that's been abandoned and learning about its history is particularly interesting. 
I'm also a bit too scared to explore areas like this in real life, so it's good to be able to do it from the comfort of my own home. It's just weird to think that it was once full of life, adults working and kids going to school, a community centre for family events, and now all that remains is weather-beaten buildings, rubble and overgrown greenery. Around a month ago, a Reddit user posted on the Reddit Bureau of Investigation asking for insight on their grandfather's death. The post is pretty concise and I think all the details are important, so I'll read part of it now. September 20-21st, 20 2018 My grandpa, 83 years old, complains of wounds on the back of his heels and he is brought to a doctor by my dad. They may have dressed the wounds, but I'm not sure. My dad doesn't remember what they did, but in any case, my grandpa was sent home the same day. Less than a week later, his in-home nurses asked my grandmother, 81 years old, and grandfather to sign some forms. She apparently believes these are for in-home care, but he is sent to a hospice centre. Later, the nursing company tells us that she has asked for the hospice form, but my grandma says she doesn't remember. He spends days in hospice, pretty much just on a morphine drip with little supervision, which makes sense for hospice, since this is dealing with someone about to die, they're assuming. My mum and I visit the hospice centre to find out why he's there, and the nurse there asks us why he's there. Is it kidney failure? she asked. We have him taken to the hospital, since he's dehydrated and hasn't been fed since, you know, they thought he was dying. But no one could tell us why he was there. By the 29th, he's in the hospital. The doctor tells the family that the only way he'll have any chance of surviving is if they amputate his feet. As you might have guessed from the title, he had an infection and advanced gangrene at this point, and his legs were wrapped in gauze, although I could still smell it when I walked into his room, where he was practically comatose. From here on, it's nothing I heard directly, but rather what I've been told. The doctor took him off the morphine they were giving him to ask if they could amputate, and he gave conflicting answers, so they went to my grandmother, who said no, because his quality of life wouldn't be good, and there was a good chance that he wouldn't survive the surgery. On October the 2nd, he is sent back to hospice, and he dies the next morning. Now, of course, this is just the mystery of his actual death. How could he be seen by a medical professional for what seemed like minor wounds, then less than two weeks later have those wounds become fatally septic? Did my grandma actually ask for the hospice forms, or is the nursing company covering its tail? Why did nobody see his feet at the hospice centre and realise he was having a medical emergency? If his in-home nurses were bathing him as they claimed, how did they not see the infection? Why were they giving my grandma forms in the first place? But what's almost more frustrating is that I saw his death certificate about a year after he died, and it was given by the hospital who saw him before he was transferred back to hospice. There was one cause of death given, which was brain degenerative disease. He did not have Alzheimer's or any symptoms of another neurodegenerative disorder, so I'm not sure where they got that. I understand that every elderly person who dies can't get an autopsy, so sometimes the cause of death may be presumed or just given by another doctor, but his feet were black. There is no possible way anyone could have missed this. There's no way the doctor seeing him would not have mentioned literally the only reason he was there, which was the infection in his feet. The doctor said that amputating his feet might save him, which directly explains what killed him. I just don't know how this happened, and it's equally mysterious and upsetting, because it feels so preventable and so unfair. What a depressing situation. It's sad enough when a family member dies, but the possibility that the death could have been prevented would make it so much worse. OP seems to be implying that someone is to blame here. They are suspicious of the in-home nurses and the hospice. They provide some context on their granddad's health in a comment, clarifying that he had in-home nurses for mobility issues and bathing, so it doesn't sound like he was terminally ill or anything. I'm sure it's not unheard of for a person to receive a very sudden diagnosis of a terminal illness and very quickly be placed in a hospice, but there's nothing to suggest that's what happened here. Opie also mentions that her granddad was a quote, horrible hypochondriac, and usually told them anything about his medical state, so it's unlikely that he or his wife hid anything from the rest of the family. They say that he was a bit senile, as most people that age would be. He had severe ADHD, but no other symptoms. The most likely explanation for him ending up in the hospice is that he and his wife signed the forms, 
and just didn't realise they were for a hospice. Whether she asked for them personally or they were just handed to her and not properly explained, I have no idea. We don't really know anything about Opie's grandma, but the whole situation is a bit of a red flag. She was either senile herself, to the point she didn't understand what she was asking for or being told, or what she was signing, in which case surely the right thing to do would be for the nurses to contact other family members to oversee the decision. Or her mind was fine, in which case why did she ask for hospice forms if her husband wasn't terminally ill? And how was he even approved for a hospice if he was relatively healthy? I'm not a doctor, but my first thought when I read about the wounds that eventually turned into gangrene was that the granddad had diabetes. This was actually mentioned in the comments by a few people too, and OP said he hadn't been diagnosed with it. There is a chance that it was undiagnosed though. People can have it for years without realising and it's very common in older people. In fact, according to the American Diabetes Association, around 26.8% of Americans over the age of 65 have diabetes, whether diagnosed or not. It's recommended that people with the condition check their feet every day, as untreated wounds can soon become seriously infected. High blood sugar levels can cause damage to the nerves and blood vessels, making the feet more prone to wounds that take longer to heal and are more likely to become infected. According to the NHS, in addition to diabetes, conditions that can increase the risk of developing gangrene include atherosclerosis, where the arteries narrow and become clogged with plaque, peripheral arterial disease, where blood supply is restricted due to a buildup of fatty deposits, and Raynaud's, where blood vessels in the fingers or toes react abnormally to cold temperatures. A weakened immune system, which may arise from HIV, long-term alcohol abuse, kidney failure, or simply old age, amongst other things, can make gangrene more likely too. Maybe that's why the nurse at the hospital assumed that the granddad was there due to kidney failure. But gangrene can occur in young and healthy people. The cause or any factors involved aren't always clear. So there are a number of possible reasons that he might have developed it, but why were none of them on his death certificate? Furthermore, why was gangrene not mentioned at all, when it almost undoubtedly seems that it was the direct cause of death? Degenerative brain disease, listed as the cause of death on the death certificate, is a collective term for a number of diseases including Alzheimer's and Lewy body dementia. Diabetes can actually contribute to some of these diseases, so it's entirely possible that Opie's granddad had undiagnosed diabetes, which caused gangrene and also degenerative brain disease. As I understand it, people don't die from such a disease, but rather due to complications of it. Once again, I'm not a doctor, so feel free to correct me in the comments if I'm wrong on any of this, but research tells me that a death certificate should list the chain of events leading up to death. An immediate cause is given, which I assume would be gangrene in this case, then any conditions that led to that cause, which is why you'd expect brain disease to be listed, and possibly diabetes or another condition that contributed to the gangrene. Opie stated that an autopsy was not performed. Conditions like Alzheimer's can only be definitively diagnosed after death though, by examining the brain tissue in an autopsy. When someone is alive, a diagnosis is usually obtained if they show symptoms and blood tests rule out other causes. According to OP, the granddad was a bit senile, but not unusually so for his age, and didn't generally display symptoms of Alzheimer's or another brain disease. So I'm not really sure how that conclusion was reached, unless the cause of death was just assumed, but I don't know if they can even do that. What really baffles me is how quickly he was resigned to death. He was lucid, still able to talk and walk, and yet less than a week later he was in a hospice centre, not being given food or water, just morphine on a drip, because they assumed he was dying, and the staff don't even seem to know why he's there. No one at the hospital could tell his family why he was there either. Maybe there is a rational explanation for all this. I at least think the cause of death has been explained, if not in the theories I mentioned here, in one of the comments on the post. But the real mystery is, was his death preventable? Perhaps whatever the root cause of all this was would have led to his death anyway, though I can't help but wonder if some of the decisions made contributed to it. Following his first stay in the hospice centre, it's hardly surprising that he died considering he was given no food or water and his wounds were left to get progressively worse. They weren't treating them, just providing pain relief. It's impossible to say whether the in-home nurses should have noticed the wound sooner and whether it would have made a difference if they did. 
By the time he ended up in hospital, amputation was his only chance of survival, so there is a possibility that he might have lived, but whether he should have ended up in this situation to begin with is debatable. I don't know for sure that OP has reason to be, but in their position, I'd probably be suspicious too. It was suggested that they request his medical records and go from there. It sounds like they plan to do so, but there are no updates as of yet. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts in the comments, plus any suggestions you might have for a future episode. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing. Huge thank you to my patrons, whose names are on screen now. I really appreciate your support. And thanks to Honeygame for sponsoring this video. Try the app now and use the code INVESTIGATOR for $5. Thanks for watching and for getting this channel to a point where I can get sponsorships. I'll see you next Thursday in a new video.